Good evening. My name, good evening. My name is Sue Weiniger, and I work in the communications department at City of Hope, and we thank all of you for being here today. I want to do a few housekeeping things before we begin the presentation. Um, these Ask the Expert lectures are t filmed, and they are, do show up on YouTube, and they are also on the City of Hope website. So if you want to tell your friend about the lecture, they can go to YouTube, the City of Hope uh, website, and, and play the entire lecture, okay? But I try not to get my little housekeeping things in there too, like where the bathrooms are and stuff like that. Um, but the restrooms are, if you go out this door, they're immediately to the left down a little hallway, okay? Um, we are allowed to bring bottled water into this room, and we do have some out in the foyer. If you'd like to get some and bring it back in, you're welcome to. Um, it's really important. You have a green evaluation form, and it's really important to City of Hope that you complete that because that allows us to present other programs and services that you're interested in in the upcoming years. So we like to get feedback, and we do read it. And um, we are taking questions with little cards, okay? So you each should have a little card, and if you have a question already in your mind, we can... Okay, we'll get you a pen. Um, if you have a question in your mind already and you know you want to ask it, you can give it to me, but we will be collecting them after the physicians speak. Okay, so just know that uh, we will be picking up questions. We're not going to be t having an open um, mic type of questions tonight. And uh, I do want to thank our ITS department who helps us in, in um, offering these programs and who sets everything up for us, which is a lot of work. And I also want to uh, thank Becky Andrews in patient, family, and community education who assist greatly with these efforts. Do we have any housekeeping questions before we start? Pardon me? Cell phones. Oh, you're good. Okay, please uh, put your cell phones on silent so that they won't interrupt our physicians. Anything else? Okay. We'll start in just a few minutes. Okay, we'll begin this evening's presentation. I want to introduce our physicians for you first, and we are very pleased that we have two outstanding specialists from City of Hope tonight. And some of you have already been to see these doctors, I think, so we're really happy to have them. Um, first of all, Dr. Wilson is with us. Dr. Timothy Wilson received his bachelor's degree from Stanford and attended medical school at Oregon Health Sciences University. He trained in neurology at USC to obtain his board certification. Dr. Wilson completed a fellowship in neurologic oncology at City of Hope in conjunction with USC in 1992. He is chief of the Division of Urologic Oncology and director of the prostate cancer program at City of Hope. He is also the first physician to hold the Pauline and Martin Collins Family Chair in Urology at City of Hope. And I'll also introduce our other physician, Dr. Twardowski. Uh, Dr. Twardowski received his medical degree from the University of Missouri in Columbia. He completed his residency in internal medicine and his fellowship in hematology oncology at Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, at City of Hope, he serves as clinical professor of medical oncology in the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research, and also is director of the Prostate Medical Oncology Program. So Dr. Wilson is going to be speaking first. Thank you so much, and welcome to City of Hope. Um, thanks for that kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, 
You know, during the introduction, um, it was mentioned that I attended both Stanford and USC, and in case there's any question whatsoever, I was, I was just overjoyed that Stanford beat USC again. <laughs> Uh, I, I grew up in this. I, I grew up in the state of Oregon, and at a young at a young age, I, I learned how to hate USC, um, and uh, it's continued. And the, the, the boys upstairs are uh, upset with me. Go Cardinal! All right. So um, tonight, so Dr. Twardowski and I worked together for years. We're going to talk about prostate cancer, and um, uh, my, my task is to talk about. Um, uh, um, prostate cancer, in a sense, when it's first diagnosed, and um, a little bit about screening and epidemiology. And um, so the, uh, my talk will probably take around 25 minutes, I think. And um, I think also you have some cards for questions that we'll be looking at and, and answering as many as we can uh, after um, the lectures. Um, also, you know, the way I've designed the talk is, uh, is I think it, I'm trying to be relatively straightforward. It's a lot of material to cover in a short period of time. Um, for some of you, it may be too basic, and I apologize for that. And for some of you, however, if you're just learning about prostate cancer, it, it could be too advanced. So you to, we're trying to find some sort of happy medium uh, to reach where we can um, transfer as much information as possible to to help those of you that are trying to make decisions about prostate cancer or PSA or screening uh, to give you some guidance as to what you might do or what, what help you might seek. So again, we'll talk a little bit about prostate cancer epidemiology, a little bit about prostate cancer screening, of course, which has been in the news quite a bit, and uh, a lot about prostate cancer treatment. Um, I'm not going to have any disclaimers. I think I already talked about Stanford and USC a little bit. <laughs> so, um, in terms of treatment also, we're going to focus primarily on active surveillance and when that's appropriate, hormone therapy, uh, radiation options, and surgery. Those are the most common things that happen to men that have prostate cancer. I'm not going to talk so much about cryosurgery or freezing the prostate or HIFU unless there's some... We had one question already which, which talks a little bit about HIFU or asks the questions about it. I'll, I'll talk about that later when that question comes up and I'll explain what HIFU is for those of you that don't know and um, how it's used. Okay, so uh, prostate cancer is uh, the most common cancer in men, although it uh, competes with lung cancer back and forth. Uh, the second leading cause of uh, cancer death in men behind lung cancer. Uh, it's estimated that in 2012 there will be over 200,000 cases. Um, this is leveled off, it's been relatively stable over the last several years. There was a bump in the early 90s and mid 90s uh, which came after we began screening for prostate cancer uh, using PSA. Um, when I, fir I first came to City of Hope in 1990, um, just talked to my youngest daughter today on the phone. She's an undergraduate up at uh, San Francisco State, and um, her birthday's coming up. She was born th that year that I came here. Um, so, uh, in 1990, uh, when, when men were diagnosed with prostate cancer, when I came to City of Hope, um, greater than 60% of men already had cancer outside the prostate. Some of the, many of these men were still curable, but the disease was fairly advanced. And the death rate at that time was about 41,000 men per year. Um, in the year 2000, we saw the first time ever a decrease in the death rate from prostate cancer. And in 2009, and this is about the same stats as today, uh, when men are first diagnosed, less than 10% actually are found to have cancer outside the prostate, either locally or to have metastatic disease. Again, what's much more common problem back then, uh, for instance, my, my grandfather died from prostate cancer, my father's father, in the 1970s. And uh, when he was diagnosed, he already had bony metastases. He had spread to bone, um, had hormone therapy, then eventually died from prostate cancer. Much more common back then. We don't see it so much anymore, thank goodness. Uh, but now the death rate has, as I said, has declined dramatically over the last 15 to 20 years. And, um, but still, obviously, way too many men, but about 28,000 men per year die from prostate cancer. So then the, the question comes up, uh, you know, should we screen? And recently, the U.S. Um, task force uh, recommended against screening, uh, but I will tell you that the national societies in urology uh, are not recommending against screening, and, and for good reason. It turns out that the task force didn't have any uh, medical oncologists on that committee, they didn't have any urologists, they didn't have any radiation oncologists, they had some primary care physicians and an uh, obstetrician, and they looked at just a few studies. Um, I, I'm only going to mention one here, 
Um, after, uh, we also acknowledge that since we started screening for prostate cancer in the early 1990s, the death rate has declined by about 30 percent. And most of us uh, that take care of men with prostate cancer believe that that decline in death rate is directly related to prostate cancer screening. And indeed, a large study recently completed in Europe <coughs> screened thousands of men. You can see on the slide here, 72,000 or, or nearly 71,000, or 70, excuse me, 73,000 men screened for prostate cancer, uh, 89,000 not. Turned out there was a lot of crossover. In other words, in the men that were not to be screened, they were getting PSAs and examined by their primary care physician. Um, having said that, um, there was a significant, there was a 20% reduction in the death rate from prostate cancer in the, meth that, in the men that were screened for prostate cancer. However, uh, where it becomes a public health issue um, is, uh, has to do with the number of men that you're screening and treating in order to cure one man with prostate cancer. So in this slide, you can see that um, in order to prevent one death from prostate cancer, the number of men needed to screen was 1,410. Once you diagnose somebody with prostate cancer, you needed to treat 48 in order to, to prevent one guy that would have died from it had he not been treated, in a sense. So that's where the public health question comes in. What, as a society, uh, we know we can decrease the death rate from prostate cancer by screening for it. Um, then the issue comes, is it, in a sense, is, is it worth it? And uh, we think it is, I think it is, but you know, society may, may or may not think that it is. They may think that something else is more important. So uh, generally speaking, those of us that, are, uh, that treat men with prostate cancer believe that that common sense is really the, uh, what, what makes sense. And so uh, we need to look at the age of the gentleman, you know, when he's screened and when he's diagnosed, look at his other medical problems. And we need to also understand, and we'll talk about this uh, over the next few minutes, you know, what his cancer is going to do over time. What's the likelihood that cancer uh, is going to um, co lead to his death or cause problems if it's not treated? Um, the good and the bad of prostate cancer is that it, it's generally slow growing. And so uh, as experts and as clinicians, we're trying to decide, you know, is the cancer going to uh, um, be the bad actor and kind of get there first, or is somebody, or is, or is that gentleman going to die of other things before the prostate cancer gets to him? And that's really kind of a crude way to put it, but that's effectively what we're, what we're looking at. And in addition, when, when, when a gentleman's diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, you know, all the options have to be uh, discussed. When men are screened for prostate cancer, these are the things that we typically do. Uh, I'll just highlight, you know, PSA is a, a blood test, uh, prostate-specific antigen. It's a, a protein that's only made by the prostate. Its function is to help uh, liquefy semen, to help this, the sperm uh, get to the egg. Um, but in fact, it's only, again, essentially only made by prostate cells, and if you don't have a prostate, you shouldn't have any PSA. Um, we also look at uh, the digital examination. For instance, if men have a nodule, a suspicious area, a bump on the prostate that's kind of hard, it would be similar if you put your finger on your, over your tooth here. We might feel a hard area like that versus on your nose is how the prostate normally feels. Uh, but this hard area of your tooth is how a prostate cancer nodule might feel. Most men don't have these today because we diagnose prostate cancer so early. But about 20% of men with a nodule on their prostate will have prostate cancer. When, when these, either one of these two things are abnormal, the PSA test or the digital examination, historically then we've gone to do an ultrasound of the prostate. This is where a probe that's about twice the size of my index finger is um, placed up the rectum to see the prostate, which, which sits, of course, just behind the pubic bone and at the bottom of the bladder. I should have had an anatomy slide here, I'm, I'm realizing, but uh, bottom line, I can, we can feel the prostate with the finger by doing a rectal examination. And uh, so we put the probe in there, we can see the prostate with ultrasound and biopsy the prostate in that way. So the American Urological Association guidelines for screening include uh, screening men uh, basically over age 40. Uh, where, of course, we know that increased risk of having prostate cancer occurs in men with a family history, a brother or a father with prostate cancer, and also African-American men have a higher risk of prostate cancer. But So we're a little bit more concerned about those men, but we generally will screen all men above the age of 40 now. Uh, there is no specific value, no cutoff, no normal value for PSA anymore. It's a continuum, and generally what we're looking at is in relation to the age of the patient, 
what that value is and what the PSA is doing over time. There are some people, for instance, that believe that all men with a PSA above 2.5 should be biopsied. Uh, however, we know that in older men, men, men above the age of 75, that probably isn't justified because as, PS, as age increases, the value of PSA goes up. Um, so we're assessing uh, all these things down here. Again, we're looking at the PSA and the digital rectal exam, the DRE. We're looking at these blood tests, the total amount of PSA, another test called free PSA. This is a ratio. Uh, PSA floats around in the bloodstream, and, that's, and the, the value you get on that blood test is the total amount. If um, it turns out that some of it floats around free or unbound, it's not, it's not, it's not um, attached to any other proteins or molecules, and it turns out that ratio of the free amount to the total amount is reflective of the risk of having prostate cancer. And if the percentage is less than 10%, the risk is highest. So for instance, if we have somebody that has a PSA of two and a half or three, um, although commonly it would be above four, but, um, and that percent free value is 10% or less, we would, we would generally say that a biopsy is indicated because the, the risk is higher. So we use things like that. In family history is important, men that have a father or a brother, I talked about ethnicity a little bit, African-American men. If someone's had a, a prior biopsy, if you had a prior biopsy and it was negative, that actually decreases the risk or likelihood that you're going to have prostate cancer in the next biopsy, although it certainly happens, and on those men, we, we monitor their PSA. So what's, what's going on now? We're kind of already in the future. Um, we're looking at other tests. There's a urine test now that's available called PCA3. It's a little bit better than just PSA by itself if we add PSA uh, to this PCA3 test. The PCA3 test, again, is a urine test. What happens here is that the urologist examines the prostate in a very specific way, and then immediately after that, uh, the gentleman will, will urinate into a container, and they, tech, and they test it for this uh, marker called PCA3. Um, and that can be, uh, and that'll give out a test that says, the result says uh, either high risk or, or low risk. Uh, gives you a percentage and a certain value, but there's a cutoff there for, uh, in addition that we can use with PSA and these other things, family history, as I said, age of the patient, to decide if a, if a biopsy is necessary. Some of the things we've worked on here at City of Hope include some of the things I won't go into, but just different biomarkers or genetic markers that uh, help uh, refine PSA, we believe. We have some, a randomized trial going on with some community urology practices now testing um, a urine test that for PCA3 uh, versus prostate fluid for different biomarkers to see which one might be best and if they can predict not only who's got prostate cancer and who doesn't in order to avoid a biopsy, but also which men may have worse cancer or are more likely to have worse cancer. Okay, so this, this is just a diagram to say that when men have a prostate biopsy, and this is a cartoon or a diagram of the prostate with these little glands up here called seminal vesicles, typically the standard now is to have a 12-core biopsy. So um, it turns out that prostate cancer occurs kind of in the back of the, of the prostate. If my fist were the prostate, um, yeah, the prostate cancer most commonly occurs in this peripheral zone here. And so this is a, um, this is looking down on, this, this diagram here is looking down on the prostate with these two little ears coming up that make semen. And this is the base, and we take one biopsy here, one biopsy here. This is called the mid portion. This is down towards the tip, just underneath the pubic bone and out towards the penis. And, um, Again, we'll, so the commonly to get two biopsies from each of these different six areas is the most common thing these days. Now, there's a fair amount of research going on now with MRI. Um, which, uh, most of you have probably heard about MRI. It's a way of scanning the body in a variety of different organs. Um, and the prostate can be scanned with MRI as well. And there are, in the past, um, it was always um, to get a specific MRI of the prostate, a special probe or coil was put in the rectum to see the prostate. There are some new scanners now available. Um, these, what are referred to as three Tesla, or more powerful MRIs that give better images of the prostate um, that uh, we think in the, in the near future, we don't use an endorectal coil here now at City of Hope anymore, 
but my point is that uh, there's a fair amount of research going on to see if we might be able to use MRI possibly to screen men for prostate cancer, um, possibly to see um, where the cancer is to help direct the biopsies. That previous, this, uh, these little cartoons here are more, they're just more random in a sense. We know where prostate cancer typically is. We're trying to hit those areas where it's most likely to be. In the future, we think that MRI will help us direct where those biopsies will go, or we can marry, in a sense, or fuse MRI with ultrasound, putting them together to help direct where the biopsy should go. And we think that in the relatively near future, over the next three to five years, that MRI may be used to monitor men that have prostate cancer without a biopsy. Perhaps, and this, is which, you know, this, this still awaits uh, studies, scientific studies, to see if we can really do this, but um, maybe, maybe we can avoid unnecessary biopsies of men down the road. Already we use it for staging, for assessing in aggressive cancers is if it's outside the prostate or not to help direct surgery. So when, when men have prostate cancer, um, there are several things they need to know about uh, to think intelligently about it and to help figure out what they're going to do about it. The first thing and the most important thing is what's called the Gleason's grade. Um, just uh, uh, briefly, uh, this guy Gleason was a pathologist. He was from Minnesota. And in the 1960s, he developed a, um, a system uh, for looking at uh, prostate cancer under the microscope. And um, it, it's still the most valuable uh, tool we have uh, for assessing what prostate cancers are going to do over time. Also, it's uh, valuable in assessing uh, how, they're gonna, how those cancers are going to respond to treatment. And so you get, first of all, you get the Gleason's grade. And the Gleason's grade is on a scale of 1 to 5. 1's the slowest growing, 5 the mo is the most aggressive. Now, before you jump to conclusions, if you have prostate cancer and you have a Gleason's grade 3, and you think, oh my goodness, uh, I'm, I'm already down the road, uh, it turns out that pathologists anymore don't really call a, or they don't, they don't describe or diagnose grades one and two. So for the most part, we only see grades three, four, and five. A pathology, we, when you have prostate cancer, or we're looking at men with prostate cancer in the pathology, they always give you two grades. So it's, if it's all grade three, then they add, they, they say, call it three plus three, and we add the two together. You might have a combination of three with a little bit of four, then it's called a three plus four. If it's primarily grade four with a little bit of three, still a seven, but then we're a little bit more concerned because the grade four is most predominant. Uh, that's why it comes as the first number. So, and on and on. So it's the scores can go typically today just from six to 10. And, that, and we will lump these scores together. So six kind of by itself, seven kind of by itself, eight, nine, and 10 is the most aggressive cancers. Okay, and so, and so we'll talk more about that as we go along. So, so men, uh, somebody gets screened, they have the ultrasound, they have the biopsy, and um, they get a Gleason score. So, you know, what do you do with that? Because um, at that point, uh, the patient is staring at all these options. Gee, I, I, I read a, you could think, think, you know, you've read a bunch of stuff in the paper about you, or you know some guy you play golf with, he never got, he never got surgery or radiation or anything. He just, he just got uh, watchful waiting. The doctor didn't do anything. Or maybe he got uh, external beam. Maybe he got protein out at Loma Linda. Uh, maybe he got seeds, what we call brachytherapy. Some guys get in combination. Some people get hormone therapy along with, with uh, external beam. Different kinds of surgery. There's open surgery. There's laparoscopic and robotic. And these are the things that we won't dwell too much on. Other, other non-surgical options, Dr. Twardowski will talk about why, maybe he'll mention why chemotherapy isn't used in men with prostate cancer when they're first diagnosed, but it's, it's not uncommonly used in men if they have metastatic or spread of prostate cancer. There's some experimental things going on. So it's a, it's a mishmash and it's confusing, and uh, even doctors can't agree what's best. So it's, it's, it's difficult um, at best for patients to try to figure out what to do. A lot of guys get stuck trying to figure out what's the best treatment for me. I guess what I often tell patients is that all the, the main treatments, whether they're radiation or surgery, there's two different kinds of radiation then. The external beam, I lump all the beam radiations together, including proton beam, because they all work about the same, and the seeds, and the surgery. These, all these things uh, compete with one another, in a sense, because they all work pretty well. So in the, in the end, when you make a decision about treatment with your uh, urologist or with the radiation oncologist or the medical oncologist, 
You simply have to be comfortable with what you're, what you're doing. Not, it isn't necessary that one, one treatment doesn't fit all men. Different things, a, a different treatment will be, and I'll help you sort some of that out as we go along here, I think. So you want to know what your, um, how you want to know how your pointer works. So you want to know how the Gleason, what the Gleason's grade is, because that tells you really what the cancer is going to do over time. Will it grow or not, most likely? What your PSA is, the clinical stage. This, remain, this means your prostate T1C. This is what your prostate feels like when the, pro, when the urologist feels it. The T1C is a smooth prostate. T2 or T3 is a bump on the prostate. T2 means to the urologist that it's a bump, but he thinks it's just localized and limited to the, what happened there? To the prostate. <laughs> and T3 means he thinks that there's physical evidence based on the, on the physical exam that there's a little bit of escape just outside. He can feel it burrowing outside the prostate. These are, these are actually pretty uncommon anymore. We don't really see T3 so much. This happened. You may wonder, well, gee, I've got cancer, but the doctor doesn't want to get any other x-rays. And in fact, uh, I'll help, if, depend, these, um, if your PSA is less than 10 and the Gleason score is 7 or less, then the one, the one good thing that managed care medicine has done for us is that it's to help determine, uh, along with other studies, that we don't really need these other x-rays. If the likelihood of finding cancer outside the prostate with a uh, bone scan or a CT scan is so low that you probably don't need them. They're not nece it isn't necessarily bad to get them because it's, good, it's a good baseline. It's a reference to go back to perhaps in the future, but oftentimes we won't get x-rays. Now, on the other hand, if your PSA is above 10, and if the Gleason score is eight or higher, uh, and if, you know, if the doctor feels a significant bump on the prostate, then he may want to get not only a bone scan, but maybe a CT scan to look for lymph nodes and see if they're enlarged or not, and he may, may want to get an MRI to see what the prostate looks like locally and, uh, and beyond, okay? So again, stratified based, should be stratified based on, on the patient. So again, and if you look statistically at what men do, uh, it's again, it's a mismatch. So these, just this is this is just to demonstrate that, um, and this is still going on today. This is 2002, but this stands for radical prostatectomy. Of all the men with prostate cancer, 2002, uh, these were. This is from the Department of, of Defense, but uh, radical prostatectomy was in 40 percent of them. Radiation was in 25 percent. Um, uh, this purple over here is uh, just watchful waiting. Uh, I guess it's the watchful waiting only. This, this dark purple is hormone therapy only. So you can see at that time, although these are the main players, uh, other things happen. And sometimes that's right, sometimes it may be wrong. Now the other thing that's popular these days is to categorize men into what's called risk categories. And as experts in prostate cancer treatment, we do it based on what the Gleason score is and also what the PSA is and also what the clinical stage is. So you can see this is, this is um, developed in what's called the D'Amico. D'Amico is a radiation oncologist at Harvard, and uh, his name got tacked to this. But so if, if you have a tiny bump on the prostate, that means a one centimeter bump or less, or you don't feel anything, if the Gleason score is six or less and the PSA is less than 10, we call you low risk. Have one of these factors, call you intermediate risk have two of these factors we call you high risk. And that affects how well treatments are going to work and it also tells the expert what the likelihood is that the cancer could come back and require another treatment depending on, on what you get. Right, we'll, take, we'll take questions at the end, sir. Yeah. So, yeah, so, we'll, so <clears throat> in terms of also decisions for treatment, the question is, is low risk uh, dependent upon age? And no, it's not. So it's independent of age, but decision making is not independent of age. All right, so a young guy with very low risk disease may get treatment because he's young and his cancer has a lot more time to grow before he gets to an old age where he's near dying of natural causes. A guy who's 85 or 90 who's closer to dying of natural causes even if he has high-risk disease, we may advise him to go on active surveillance or just minimal treatment, not non-aggressive treatment. That's kind of how we're trying to think about it. So for instance, 
Um, this is where a lot of the controversy comes. This is an old slide, but it's still true today for the most part. So we, when we stratify men with low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, and these different lines here, you may can't under, probably can't see this in the back, the blue one is surgery. The dotted one is external beam, any kind of be is external beam radiation. And proton beam is exactly the same. There's no difference in the cure rate. Um, and it doesn't have less side effects. We'll, we'll leave it at that. So um, if you put implants in along with hormone therapy, it's this solid black line. If you just implants alone, it's this. So anybody with low risk is going to do pretty damn good. The intermediate risk guys do intermediately well. Surgery and the external beam seem to do a little bit better. And we'll talk about this, how you can make these guys do better. And in the high risk, nobody does great. Now, this doesn't mean these guys are dying from prostate cancer. This just means that the first treatment, whatever they got, didn't work as well as it should. And what this means is, so some of these graphs are hard to read. This just means that uh, as these get lower, these men are having recurrences of cancer. So the straight of the line is the better. As it falls off, more men are having a recurrence of cancer. I'm hoping that's makes. So um, what about active surveillance? So active surveillance doesn't mean we forget about the cancer. So for instance, um, it simply means that we're going to monitor men closely because we think the cancer is unlikely to cause them problems or lead to their death. And this is more popular today as it should be. Uh, people are, you know, understandably afraid of cancer. Hell, you know, we all know somebody who had prostate cancer. I told you my grandfather died from it. My stepdad had a radical prostatectomy when he just turned 83 when he was 68. My brother-in-law had a radical prostatectomy when he was 56. Everybody knows somebody with prostate cancer. Um, you know, the issues are how do you best manage it? Um, so active surveillance means we're carefully monitoring the prostate uh, with PSAs about every three months, and we'll usually re-biopsy the prostate once a year. What we're trying to do there is to make sure that the, that the subsequent biopsies don't show a worse cancer, in other words, don't show a progression of the Gleason score, that the Gleason score isn't going from a 6 to a 7 or higher, or that the percentage, the volume of cancer isn't getting higher. Because if those things happen, we're more concerned that that cancer is going to get outside the prostate and cause problems, and we want to intervene and, and stop it before that happens. Okay? So active surveillance is appropriate for men of all ages, even young guys. And recent studies have shown it's safe. A recent study from Johns Hopkins, for instance, looked at about 800 men with low risk disease, PSA less than 10, Gleason score 6, a smooth prostate or no more than a bump, a tiny bump in their prostate, followed them for 15 years, none of them died from prostate cancer. About half of them got treatment, 40 to 50% got treatment because their cancer progressed with the subsequent biopsy or their PSA went up and they got nervous or their doctor convinced them, but bottom line, men can safely be followed if they meet the criteria for active surveillance. So this just describes that based on risk, again, these, these risk categories, let me get rid of that, that, uh, so this is low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Of the men, when they start out here, how many of these guys end up going on to have treatment over time? And the high risk guys are more likely to because they have worse disease. I'm going to switch over to hormone therapy. What's, what is hormone therapy and, and when do we use it? Hormone therapy is based on the fact that prostate cancer is stimulated by the male hormone testosterone. This was discovered in the 1940s, I think, okay? and um, has to do with the fact that uh, so prostate cancer stimulates, is stimulated by testosterone. If we take away testosterone or block testosterone from a man's body, that prostate cancer will typically go into remission. It will regress. It will decrease in size. And um, consequently, men will go into remission. It typically isn't a cure, but Dr. Tordowski will tell you about some new treatments with hormone therapy that are pretty remarkable and allow men to live for a long period of time, even with, with spread of prostate cancer. Um, some examples of names are Lupron and Casadex. So hormone therapy almost always works, but again, for a variable period of time, depending on how much cancer there was to begin with and what the Gleason score was. So as you would, common sense, if, the, if cancer is more aggressive and if the volume of cancer is higher, the hormone therapy will generally work for less time. Um, it helps radiation work better. Well, I'll say this again later, but multiple studies have shown that if you add hormone treatment to external beam radiation and the seeds, it makes those therapies work better and the cure rates are better. 
It'll shrink the prostate and help men urinate better. It, but on the other hand, it de decreases sex drive because it takes away testosterone, causes hot flashes, uh, similar to what women get, go through when they when they go through menopause. Uh, this is not; be these drugs are not uh, female hormones. They're not anymore. We don't use estrogens, but without testosterone, men will get hot. Some men will get hot flashes and cause osteoporosis and anemia over time. Some indication that it may cause some heart disease uh, if left on for more than two years or so. But what, let's say that we want to do something besides uh, active surveillance uh, and uh, hormone therapy, and we want to do that because the cancer is more aggressive or because the patient decides, uh, even though I know, uh, he says, even though I, I know I've only got uh, low risk disease and I could go on active surveillance, I want to be treated aggressively. I want to try to cure the cancer and get rid of it. So we talked briefly, I want, again, I'll, if we have time, we could come back to these. This is freezing the prostate. It's available in the United States. We don't use it here. This is uh, high intensity focused ultrasound. It's used in Europe in some places, Canada and Mexico, not FDA approved yet in the United States. I personally think for good reason. We don't think it, I don't really think it works all that well. Um, but the radiation options are most common, such as therapy or putting in seeds external beam, and there's a variety of those. They all work about the same, and they're administered in a very similar way. Uh, one is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, taking out the prostate is this. As I said, chemotherapy is not typically used for men that are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer. What about external beam radiation? This is just a, this is kind of how it's done. Um, Men are put into a linear accelerator, uh, sometimes with a CT scan attached, to see the prostate. And uh, in doing that, um, the prostate is seen here. These are the pelvic bones. And they can direct the dose through these different angles with a dose given on each day so they can focus the radiation most on the prostate. One potential problem Ed, that used to be with earlier techniques and is less so today is the fact that because you have to pass the radiation energy through different parts of the body, it can affect different organs. Uh, it's not a movie, but it's a, um, a, a look at what we, we have here now, uh, the latest kind of, a, of a photon beam radiation or tomotherapy. Again, where um, uh, in a sense a tiny CT scan is done each day the patient need, gets treatment. and. Um, it's used to know exactly where the prostate is so the radiation can be focused onto the prostate. This is a, a study that showed that external beam radiation by itself versus hormone therapy, hormone therapy had an improvement overall survival and disease-free survival. You can see it's significant bumps. So in men with intermediate risk and high-risk prostate cancer, it's generally re recommended if those guys elect not to have surgery to be, and they're going to be treated and to get beam radiation, the radiation oncologist will oftentimes add hormone therapy kind of before, during, and after the uh, radiation. And here, this was, um, I think, for three, see, for three got, got hormone therapy. So the pros and cons, uh, the good news is it's done as an outpatient, although it takes about eight weeks to uh, do, very low risk. It is about four or five times more expensive than surgery or the seeds. And you can get, but it's relatively rare, long-term irritation of the bowel and bladder. <clears throat> Again, hormone therapy is used, HT. High-risk men. There is indeed a slight risk of a secondary cancer. Even if, even if external beam cures the prostate cancer 20 years down the road or a little bit longer, so for young men, we don't usually use it. You can increase the risk of getting a urinary bladder cancer or a rectal cancer or a pelvic bone cancer. So um, that needs to be taken into consideration. And if you have a recurrence of cancer in the prostate, hard to treat with surgery. And um, I'll leave it at that. This is just a, uh, some pictures of the seeds for brachytherapy. So these little seeds that are radioactive, either iodine or palladium, are placed in the, this is a cartoon of how the prostate is measured with this ultrasound probe in the rectum. This is supposed to represent the bladder. We generate the exact volume of the prostate. Then here's a probe in the rectum. This is the, this template. 
Down here, this is an x-ray, a CT scan showing the C prostate. The rectum sits down here. You can see the pubic bone up here. But the C just kind of like, I think of it as kind of a, it makes a cloud of radiation covering the whole prostate. It's a little bit more accurate, I think, than external beam, and you can actually deliver more radiation. This again shows, again, from a center in Seattle that does exclusively brachytherapy, that low-risk men do very well, intermediate risk, intermediate risk men do good, but not quite as well. High-risk men are the most difficult to treat. Pros and cons. Again, the nice thing about brachytherapy, putting seeds in, is an outpatient treatment. We do it in the operating room while men are asleep, but they go home the same day. They don't need a catheter for very long. They're back to work usually within a week. Sometimes we'll give, if men are intermediate or high risk, we give additional external beam radiation for four weeks about a month later. Less radiation exposure than external beam to the neighboring organs, but it'll cause swelling of the prostate and consequently blockage. So if men already have, get up a lot at night, have a slow stream, I'll generally recommend that they don't get brachytherapy, even if they're low risk where it works the best, because it'll, it'll make them get up more at night, it'll slow down their stream, and, and it'll make it more difficult for them to urinate, even though the cure rate could be quite high. So I think that's, so we have to assess, again, the overall status of the patient, how well he, not only what the status of his cancer is, his age, his health, how well he urinates, sexual function, things like that. But what about surgery? Surgery means we're taking out the entire prostate. The term is radical prostatectomy. Uh, that's a bad term uh, because it sounds bad, but um, really what it means is complete prostatectomy, taking out the whole prostate plus these little glands that are attached to it that can sometimes be involved with prostate cancer. These little glands are called seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles really have no value once the prostate's out. As I said, the prostate simply makes fluid that, as the, do the seminal vesicles, um, that um, facilitate uh, conception. Uh, but the prostate has nothing really to do necessarily with erections or sexual function or sex drive or sensation of the penis. Um, however, the treatments can, can screw those things up, but the, but the prostate itself is not really necessary for, again, for sex drive, for sensation of the penis, for normal erections. It's just that the nerves that are responsible for erections sit next to the prostate. So uh, along with removing the prostate, we're removing sometimes some lymph nodes. This is an advantage over radiation. I'm a surgeon, so I'm obviously I'm, in, I'm more in favor of uh, surgery than radiation, so I have that bias. But, but that's uh, important in intermediate and high-risk men. We want to examine lymph nodes because somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of men in intermediate and high-risk can have microscopic spread to lymph nodes that we can't see on a CT scan or an MRI. And the only way we can know if they're involved with cancer is by taking them out and examining them with the pathologist. We've done a lot of robotic prostatectomies here, and I'm almost done. This is, if you, this is just a little video of the robot. It's been around since 1999. FDA approved for prostate treatment and prostate cancer prostatectomy in 2001, and the surgeon sits at a console, and these arms, controlled by the surgeon entirely, can't do anything on its own, instruments that slip into the patient through little tiny um, we, we do the not done the big cut surgery here since December of 2000. And this device was approved for prostatectomy, as I said, in 2001. So it's a fancy looking device. Um, really, in the end, what it allows us to do is do very precise surgery, very controlled surgery. Um, you can see here the, the surgeon is controlling the arms of the robot with these little joysticks. And he's looking into a viewer. I'll stop this in a second, but he's looking into a viewer things with about 14-fold magnification. So you get, because of the pressure used during laparoscopic surgery, there's very little bleeding, typically. Very precise, consistent, reproducible surgery. Cancer control rates are the same as the open surgery. Um, it's just that some of the outcomes, men recover a little bit more quickly. Blood loss is, is less, as I said. And men recover bladder control and sexual fun function a little bit 
quicker. So this simply shows, again, similar to those DMECO risks. So for low risk, this is our some of our early experience at City of Hope. Again, we've got about 6,000 of these now. High risk, so a little bit better than radiation, I think, but um, again, not a head-to-head -head study. And so when um, men are trying to make a decision, again, you need to take into account what your risk category is. Am I low risk? Because if I'm low risk and I don't have any symptoms, then any really anything really works relatively well, and I, and I would do whatever you're most comfortable with, meaning that um, some men uh, are surgically oriented. In other words, uh, they think, I've got cancer, I always want to get it out. Other people want nothing to do with surgery. The good news in prostate cancer is we have these different options and you can kind of pick and choose. It becomes more difficult if you fall into an intermediate risk category or a high risk category because then um, the, the, the treatment, um, nothing works perfectly well and there isn't a huge difference between the number of cancer recurrences after surgery or either kind of radiation. But I would argue as a surgeon that surgery gives you more options down the road. If you have your prostate out and there's a recurrence of prostate cancer in the area where the prostate used to be because some microscopically had escaped, we have a better chance of curing that by then we can layer, we can give you radiation after surgery. Whereas if you have the radiation first of either kind and the cancer is persistent or recurs in the prostate, much more difficult problem because the radiation will affect the tissues around the prostate. That's about it. This is about, just about, I have about two more slides. This has to do with the fact that with robotic surgery, it's come a long ways. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, there's, um, I'll, uh, uh, tomorrow I'm flying to London to go to a meeting that I, I go to every year for, it's called the European Robotic Urologic Symposium. In that meeting, for over the last several years, I've watched other surgeons around the world operate. I pick up different techniques. Uh, I don't, we don't believe here that we know all the answers. We believe that you know, everybody is thinking about the same things, trying to make, make this operation a better operation. This slide simply points out all these different techniques that are used during surgery that you can't sort out, but it reminds me to tell you that we're doing multiple things to try to make the surgery better. And this is just uh, a look that I uh, You've already seen a little bit of how the robot works. This is just an example of some of the things we're doing. Actually, those are the nerves that we're sparing. Ladder that sits down in the pelvis underneath the... ...bend the bladder to prevent leakage of urine. And this is just a slide showing that most men recover well over time. This is different techniques to see how women, how men after surgery recover their bladder control. Recently we looked at uh, 508 men that were operated on between these two years um, and they all had good erections before surgery and at two years after surgery about nearly 75% of them, all men, were able to have natural erections and able to have natural intercourse. Younger men do better than older men. So 90% of guys 55 and younger were having natural erections and able to have natural falls off. It used to be with, with open surgery, this number was zero. So we made some progress, but age is a factor because it affects how men heal. And we also, uh, if we use Viagra a lot after surgery, Viagra, we could, we don't have enough time to talk about it, but it doesn't cause an erection unless you're stimulated in some way sexually and, or, or, and if the nerves are working. So, um, but we know that if you get, take Viagra on a regular basis after surgery, it helps, it helps the recovery of erections. This is simply to point out that, that there's no one perfect treatment. This is what are called quality of life scores. So this is uh, brachytherapy, IB. This is external beam and this is the beam. All men start, you know, the group start up here at baseline, they get treated in one month, they all come down, although the beam radiation guys Better, but 12 months or so after the treatment, they're all at about hard. But again, you have to decide with the urologist: is one treatment good for me based on what my risk category is, how well I urinate, 
my age, other medical problems, those kinds of things. Talked about these things. So things that favor surgery include, you know, higher risk men, men that have trouble urinating, getting the urine out, irritation to the bladder actually are, I think, better treated with surgery, large prostates, previous prostate surgery, um, because radiation can irritate the colon, like uh, irritable bowel syndrome or things like that, uh, or a history of bladder cancer. So I'll stop there and let Dr. This is my son, week 40. I'll let, uh, I'll let Dr. Twardowski uh, take over. Thanks a lot, Tim. It was uh, very uh, interesting as always, and those uh, videos are, are fantastic. I've seen them many times, but they're, they're always very impressive. Um, so, so I'm a medical oncologist, and uh, we certainly collaborate a lot uh, with uh, urologists uh, in the, the treatment of the whole spectrum of prostate cancer, but as medical oncologists, we are not performing surgeries. We are mostly dealing with medications, drugs, Typically, we get involved in cases where the prostate cancer is at high risk. Those are the cases that uh, the Dr. Wilson mentioned, or in fact, the cases that uh, might have already spread you know, to distant organs. And those are situations where surgery or any kind of local therapy is not gonna be curative. Now, those cases, fortunately, are becoming rarer and rarer, and I would completely echo what uh, Dr. Wilson said, that even when I started my career as a fellow you know, in the, in the mid-90s, it wasn't that unusual to see patients coming to the office with bone metastasis as a first presentation of prostate cancer. Patient would present with severe back pain, no history of prostate cancer. We would do appropriate evaluation, including PSA tests done for the first time could be in the hundreds, you know, sometimes in the thousands and that pretty much clinched the diagnosis. Now those cases are fortunately extremely rare, but still about 5% of patients that we see here, even at the City of Hope, uh, present with metastatic disease. Uh, and approximately, as, uh, as Dr. Wilson mentioned, approximately when you average those low, intermediate, high-risk cases, when you saw about 20% of patients that are treated with local therapy with curative intent, with every expectation and hope that they will be cured, are still going to have recurrence down the line. So even though these cases are relatively rare, but because of sheer numbers of prostate cancers, they tend to be, uh, be quite significant and obviously life-threatening over a long run. I think the epidemiologic data Tim already presented, so the good news is that the mortality is relatively low in comparison to incidence of prostate cancer, but still, a you know, very high number of, of patients uh, die from prostate cancer in the United States. And, and that's the second uh, most common cause of cancer-related mortality behind lung cancer. So as Dr. Wilson mentioned, you know, the, the concept of hormone therapy for prostate cancer, for advanced prostate cancer, really goes back quite a long time. Uh, in fact, in early 1940s, uh, Dr. Charles Huggins, who was a surgeon, urologist at the University of Chicago, really gets credit for this first association between hormonal system and stimulation of prostate cancer growth. So he really made the connection in the clinical sense in patients and in fact in the laboratory as well that testosterone hormone and other related hormones stimulate prostate cancer growth. And if you can somehow withdraw or reduce the levels of testosterone in patients with prostate cancer, that could be beneficial. And, and frankly, this is one of the most amazing discoveries in medicine when you think about it in terms of number of patients that were helped and how durable this discovery is. Because as I'll show you later, with all the progress that we are doing, I mean, in some ways, essentially what we're doing are variations on the same theme of hormonal therapy. We're just refining them, making them better, but that still constitutes the bulk of the systemic treatments that we have for prostate cancer that has spread outside of the uh, organ. 
Uh, so Dr. Huggins published this paper in the Archives of Surgery in 1941, and this is just a kind of quick excerpt uh, from the text. He describes patients who gained from three to 18 kilograms. So for those of you who are not familiar with metric system, just multiply it by 2.2 and that will be pounds. And their appetites and red cell counts increase. In nine of the 11 patients with severe pain, complete or nearly complete relief of pain was achieved and maintained. Some of these patients were previously bedridden and barely able to eat or move. And the authors conclude that the improvement was greater than uh, we have observed in any case in which far advanced or metastatic carcinoma of the prostate was treated in any other way. So uh, this was quite an impressive uh, uh, discovery, but as always in cancer medicine, th there comes disappointment that, that this uh, treatment was effective typically for a period of time, maybe a year or two, in some patients longer, but eventually started failing. So, so that's the problem. It's very effective. Uh, it causes shrinkage of prostate cancer in vast majority of patients. But on average, it lasts about two years. I mean, some patients certainly can last longer. I have uh, patients in my practice who have been just on some simple hormone therapy, Lupron injection or Zoladex injection for metastatic prostate cancer to the bones now for 10 years plus, and they're doing great. So there is this fraction of patients that certainly can have very excellent control of prostate cancer with hormone therapy for a prolonged period of time. But it's not the rule, unfortunately. The rule is more closer to about two-year um, effectiveness. I think I'm going to skip this next slide because that gets maybe a little too molecular. It's just uh, showing that there are now identified multiple causes of resistance to hormonal therapy. And we are now beginning, finally, to understand them better and exploit them in some newer therapies that we are uh, developing. Uh, now, I have to say that. Uh, prostate cancer field um, has been kind of lagging behind for, for many decades uh, when you compare it uh, to maybe other uh, tumor types like breast, colon cancer, when you've, uh, scientists identify mul multiple targets that could be uh, actually uh, approached therapeutically. With prostate cancer, Going back to 1941, as I mentioned, there were some minor refinements of that, and for many decades, we really didn't have any substantial improvements in treatment. Um, in 2004, there was a chemotherapeutic agent called Taxotir that was approved that certainly was helpful and extended life in patients uh, with advanced prostate cancer, but compared to other tumor types, we were, we were certainly way behind. This is just a list of frustrating clinical trials that were performed between these years with various uh, therapeutic uh, uh, approaches ranging from vaccines to some uh, vitamins to some targeted agents, chemotherapeutic agents. Bevacizumab has been helpful in colon cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer, but it really failed in prostate cancer. So we haven't had really a lot of luck with uh, some of these new newer agents uh, for, for a long time. I think maybe out of frustration, I think we started looking back at hormone therapy because that's been one area that we've been really successful for decades and uh, try to really refine the treatments and try to maybe uh, look for some areas that we can improve hormone therapy and um, allow it to work better and, and maybe restore the effectiveness of hormone therapy upon the development of resistance. And one of the key observations that was made uh, in the last few years was the fact that there are many testosterone hormone sources in the body. So we've always thought of testosterone as being produced primarily in the testicles, and that's definitely true. Approximately 90% of testosterone in man is produced by the testicle. We knew a little bit about the uh, production of uh, testosterone or other derivative hormones in the adrenal glands, and we've had medications that would address that source. So this would be surgical approach, for example, removal of testicles called orchiectomy, or medications that some of you are familiar with, uh, injections of Lupron, Zoladex, or uh, similar medications. We've had a medication called bicalutamide or Casadex that would uh, block uh, function of testosterone uh, derived from adrenal gland. But what's been discovered in the last few years is in fact, that uh, in the typical kind of cancer 
way of uh, developing resistance and adaptability, over time, when the cancer cells are deprived of external sources of testosterone with those medications, they start making their own testosterone. That has been not quite appreciated uh, until recently. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so this is this is terrible. I mean, essentially, what and this is an example. The similar scenarios can be found in breast cancer, you know, with different hormones, of course. But this is one of the ways these these cancer cells always find a way to to bypass or to to resist in the treatments that are applied towards them over a period of time. And the way that that happens is that they actually start developing their own enzymatic machinery to actually they can produce testosterone either from scratch, you know, all the way from cholesterol, which is the first building block, or testosterone, or they just uh, they just take up some precursors or early hormones uh, that are present in the synthesis of testosterone, and then complete the whole synthesis inside, and essentially it results in the presence of testosterone inside the cell that is sufficient to stimulate the growth. And, and this is just kind of another example uh, here, uh, which is again very kind of scientific slide, but on the y-axis uh, uh, we are measuring testosterone levels, concentrations, and here on the x-axis have various clinical scenarios. And you can see that in those M cases, those are patients who had metastatic disease actually biopsied, metastatic lesions biopsied. And those patients were already treated with hormonal therapy that was supp supposed to suppress testosterone very low. It turns out that in fact testosterone levels are very high in the tissue. So that's again the supportive evidence that there is a, there is this ongoing process of testosterone either synthesis or production or absorption into the tumor tissue. And you can, when you do a microscopic analysis uh, of uh, some of these uh, tissue specimens and stains for it, and the kind of darker reddish or purple stain indicate the positive expression or presence of specific enzyme, which is, has a complicated name, but this particular enzyme is one of the key enzymes that is necessary for the production of testosterone in the cancer cell. So you can see that in metastatic lesions, you have a lot of that enzyme versus in the normal prostate or benign primary uh, or, or prostate cancer that is still in the prostate uh, gland itself, the production of this enzyme is, is very low. So again, this is a mechanism that the cancer cells uh, adapt with to, to increase production of testosterone. Uh, this just illustrates the kind of complicated uh, process of synthesis or production of testosterone from cholesterol, because there are multiple steps, and it turns out that one of these key enzymes that really has to be present, regardless where the production of testosterone takes place, whether it's in the testicle, whether it's in the adrenal gland, or whether it's actually in the tumor tissue, in the tumor cell, they have to have this enzyme called CYP17. So that's the necessary step. So if you can block that enzyme, the production of testosterone with, will cease regardless of the location of it. And that's really, that discovery led to the uh, development of this drug called abiraterone or Zytiga that some of you may be familiar with. It was approved by FDA um, uh, about, uh, about a year and a half. Um, so uh, this was a study, it was a brief summary of the study that led to approval uh, of this compound. We participated here at the City of Hope and from the very beginning, we were quite impressed with the activity of this compound. This was applied to patients who really had a very advanced disease that, that they, not, they not only failed standard hormonal therapy, but they also had to have exposure to chemotherapy agent like Taxotere. So, so they seemingly were already beyond hormone therapy, and, and it was a little bit counterintuitive to, to think, well, why would you go back to a form of hormonal therapy again? But it turns out that it was quite effective in terms of responses and, and overall survival curves were significantly separated between placebo and uh, abiraterone. So this uh, higher curve indicates prolonged survival in patients who are uh, treated with, with abiraterone. Now, obviously, when you look at the absolute value of difference, the, the difference in survival is not that much, approximately four months on average. But uh, that somehow, that, that sometimes I think is a little bit misunderstood by uh, 
by physicians and, and frankly by the patients as well. And because it doesn't mean necessarily that every patient who takes abiraterone will live, you know, will, will live about four months longer than patients taking placebo. It's just an average. There are probably patients that get much more benefit out of abiraterone, probably a year plus or even more, versus some other patients may not. And we're still in the process of trying to understand who would be the patient that actually would have the best chance of having you know, significant prolongation of life with, uh, with abiraterone. Um, the other agent that has been just approved uh, approximately just two weeks ago is called enzalutamide, or Extandi is, is the trade name. This is also a hormonal agent that has some similarity to the compound that some of you also may be familiar with called bicalutamide or Casodex. So both of these compounds work in a similar fashion uh, by the fact that they block the testosterone receptor. So that's that um, protein to which the testosterone actually has to bind on the surface of uh, prostate cancer cell to induce its effect. And uh, uh, bicalutamide or, or casodex or this enzalutamide extandi uh, bind to that receptor and prevent the signaling uh, of that receptor downstream to inside the cell to then instruct cancer cell to divide and grow. Now, uh, enzalutamide is much more effective than bicalutamide in terms of its potency. There are also some uh, significant molecular differences uh, that were discovered. For example, it's been found that bicalutamide or casodex, when it's applied over time, it initially may actually block the prostate cancer growth, but over time, prostate cancer cells can learn how to use casodex to grow. So it's a very frightening, another mechanism of adaptation of prostate cancer cells that instead of being blocked by the medication, they actually adapt, mutate, and they start utilizing it for its growth. So we have found that sometimes when you actually stop bicalutamide or casodex, cancer regresses again. So that gives you an idea that this medication was completely unhelpful in that setting. Now, fortunately, enzalutamide does not produce that kind of, uh, or does not allow this kind of adaptation by the cancer cell. At least it has not been uh, discovered yet. So we are hoping that this kind of resistance and adaptation uh, will not occur upon uh, exposure with uh, uh, enzalutamide agent. So this is an example of kind of early assessment of this drug when it was tested in the early clinical studies, uh, phase one and two and those uh, vertical bars going downwards indicate patients who had declined in the PSA, and uh, bars going up indicate patients who had rise in PSA. So you can see that there were, majority of patients had a very significant declines in the PSA, whether it was uh, in the setting prior to chemotherapy or even if they already had exposure uh, and frequently resistance to chemotherapy, they still had a very significant dramatic drops in PSA in that setting, indicating activity of that compound. That led to a clinical trial, uh, again, comparing uh, active agent versus placebo, which is unfortunately the only way we can ultimately determine whether the drug is definitely effective, at least by FDA standards. We participated here uh, at the City of Hope um, and we were also quite impressed with this agent from, from several standpoints. The first thing that was quite impressive, and, and as you can see, there is, there is a, again, the placebo component. When you put the patients on the study and uh, saw them on the first visit uh, after they were started on this treatment, a month uh, later, you could not tell whether they are taking placebo or active medication because really the side effect profile is minimal. They, they, they don't see any... Uh, changes. There's no usually uh, typical uh, side effects that you see with chemotherapy, no hair loss, no nausea, vomiting. Fatigue is very minimal. So, so that was certainly very encouraging that at least there are no side effects associated with it. Uh, and then obviously uh, the efficacy ultimately became quite apparent. We've had patients who've been on this drug for more than two years and in the setting where they were already failing chemotherapy, and frankly, the anticipated survival of these patients were short. So uh, in November 2011, there was a press release uh, showing that the interim analysis of the study showed significant uh, survival advantage 
in favor of patients who were taking uh, enzalutamide, and then all the patients who were taking still placebo were notified, and they were allowed to cross over and start taking the real drug, because that became apparent that this drug is, is definitely effective. So you can see the differences in survival, in PSA response rates, uh, in quality of life, and so on. So this compound has been just approved by FDA a couple of weeks ago and is available and we're beginning to treat uh, our patients who, uh, who need it. This is again kind of illustration of these uh, differences in survival and uh, uh, radiographic uh, parameters or PSA parameters in favor of uh, enzalutamide. Uh, interestingly, there are a lot of agents from the group of hormonal therapy that are still in development that we are participating in this trial. So there is a long list of agents that some of them probably will be approved over the next uh, couple of years. So the whole theme of hormone therapy is definitely not finished. We are still looking at newer agents that will better block that uh, testosterone or androgen pathway that is so critical for, uh, for prostate uh, cancer growth. But there are certainly other types of therapies that we're working on. Uh, in fact, there were some of them that were already approved. Uh, uh, the Cipulacil T, or Provenge, is the first uh, immunotherapeutic agent approved in prostate cancer, and in fact, in, in all the solid tumor malignancies. So this is a compound that is uh, essentially stimulating patients' own immune system to develop immune response against prostate cancer. It's a rather complicated process of developing this compound. It's an individualized treatment, so uh, it's uh, specifically designed for each patient and produced for each patient. And it uh, uh, involves the collection of patients' own immune cells from the blood through the process of phoresis, which is essentially sitting in the chair connected to the uh, machine that filters patients' blood. And these cells that are subsequently incubated outside of the body with a prostate-specific protein. Um, and that takes approximately 48 to 72 hours. That prostate-specific protein called PAP is then ingested into the immune cell and then expressed on the surface. And, and this, is, uh, this results in activation of the immune cells uh, with a specific focus against prostate cancer. And then this, these cells that are collected and, and incubated uh, are shipped back to the infusion center in our clinic. And the bag of these cells, it essentially looks like the blood transfusion, is infused back to the patient. And we think that what happens is that they essentially recruit some other immune cells called, called uh, T cells to actually fight cancer cell and provide anti-cancer approach. So this is a very kind of intriguing, interesting, um, mechanism of action uh, that, uh, that resulted in FDA approval of this compound. This is kind of an illustration of the logistics of uh, this whole process. First is the apheresis center that performs the collection of the cells. Then they are shipped uh, to the processing facility for incubation and activation. Then they are shipped back to the office and reinfused back to the patient. Um, we've also participated in clinical trials with this compound that was compared to placebo and again showed improvement in survival. Again, those average improvements in survival are maybe not very impressive. You're looking at you know, three, four, five months with all these agents on average. But then when you start looking at some subsets of patients, you realize that again, it does not mean that, well, if I get this product, I'm only going to live uh, four months longer. It's not the case. The, for example, in patients who had PSA of less than 10, a relatively low cancer burden, uh, the survival advantage or improvement in, uh, over, over patients who received placebo was more than a year. So you are getting finally to the, the finally getting some results that I think are quite meaningful. Um, and especially if you can add those compounds together or, or sequence them one after another, you're adding a year, five months, six months, and, and again and again. So eventually it starts adding up into years that we are now able to extend survival of patients even with very advanced and resistant uh, prostate cancer. The other compound that is making a lot, of, uh, a lot of news, and some of you might have heard about it, is called uh, uh, cabozantinib. This is a pill, 
and it's um, uh, essentially an, uh, so it's an oral agent that, uh, that is in the category of targeted agents. And it's, it's again, a rather complicated slide, but it, it's designed to illustrate that there are two other pathways that we found in the um, mechanism of prostate cancer growth and progression that are very important. One is called VEGF, and once is called, the other one is called HGF or CMAT. So these two pathways or enzymatic processes uh, cooperate together to allow prostate cancer cells to grow and especially invade bones, which we know is one of the areas where the prostate cancer cells like to migrate and, and travel. So with this compound that blocks these two pathways, the VEGF and uh, CMET pathway, we've seen uh, about 70% of patients having significant regression. Probably what's most impressive with this compound is the effect that you actually see on the bone metastasis that is illustrated here. So I don't think you need to be a radiologist to uh, realize you know, that those black spots here uh, scattered across the skeleton are not good. The normal bones should be looking like this, kind of light gray. So here is metastatic lesion, here, here, you know, multiple, essentially innumerable metastasis in this patient. Now after 12 weeks, the, there is essentially a complete resolution. I mean, if you look at this bone scan, I challenge you to find you know, any remaining area. This is just bladder area where the, where the contrast material normally accumulates, so this is normal physiologic finding. You can actually see, interestingly, that here there's very little uh, contrast material in the bladder because it all went into the metastatic sites. And now here it's all excreted normally into the bladder. Uh, here are some other examples, pre and post therapy with this agent. So we're very excited about it. We will be opening a clinical trial very soon with this compound. Again, in patients with frankly quite advanced diseases. So this is a setting where you have a patient who failed standard hormone therapy, who must have failed, in fact, one of those previous second line newer hormonal agents like abiraterone, Zytiga, or enzalutamide and in fact could have been already treated with chemotherapy as well. Um, so um, this is the kind of setting where frankly we right now don't have a lot of therapeutic mm -hmm. options and I think it will be very helpful uh, for us to have access to that compound. Um, and I would like to finish uh, with another agent that uh, is very close to approval by FDA. Um, hopefully this year or maybe early next year, this is a different concept. This is something called a radioisotope. Uh, uh, so it's essentially the radioactive uh, compound that is um, infused into the vein. So it is form of radiation, but it's not delivered from the outside, but it's designed to actually deliver radiation from inside of the body. And the, the way it works is that, uh, that this compound, radium-223, uh, is, has a very similar structure. When you look at the periodic table of elements, it's very close to where the calcium is. And you know, as you obviously know, calcium is, is a major component of the bone structure. So, so essentially, it tends to accumulate when you infuse it. It doesn't go anywhere in the body except into the bones, and somehow, preferentially, it accumulates in the areas where the cancer cells are sitting in the bone and disturbing normal bone structure. And it uh, emits very short-acting radiation beam. So it's essentially a less than a millimeter uh, length. So it provides essentially very short-range, powerful alpha radiation to cancer spots from within. It's given as an infusion every four weeks, I think, for several times. And it also has been shown to improve overall survival in patients who have failed a lot of standard therapies in the past for advanced metastatic disease. So this should be approved by FDA, um, as I said, probably later this year. I, I think we are a little bit uh, a little over time. So I will just summarize that from the standpoint of treatment of advanced prostate cancer, of metastatic disease, there has really been significant acceleration of the new drug development. And, and I haven't even mentioned probably three or four drugs that have a legitimate shot of being approved for advanced prostate cancer in the next uh, two, three years. And progress is seen in several areas of drug development, uh, certainly hormonal therapy I gave you an example of, immunotherapy with Provenge, 
targeted therapy with this drug cabozantinib, radioisotopes, um, this radium-223. Chemotherapy, I didn't mention, frankly, because uh, of uh, time limitations, but it still plays a role. But I would say that in the current uh, uh, environment that the, the hormonal therapy probably still is generating the most enthusiasm because we are really developing these agents that continue to surprise us and continue to provide benefit uh, to patients with a relatively uh, low side effect profile. And I would say that chemotherapy use is really being delayed these days with the advent of these new less toxic agents, but we still use agents like docetaxel or taxotere or or cabazitaxel in certain uh, circumstances. So I will probably close uh, with that, and, and thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer questions. Are we um, taking Jemek? Thanks. Collecting your questions, Becky and I. Thank you. <laughs> and we have a mic here, an extra mic. So if you have a question, please please use your index card. We'll collect them. <laughs> I, I've, I've looked at these. So, you know, just, just we probably can't answer all the questions, but we'll try. And I've, I've gone through some of them, and then Dr. Twardowski, I've, we've, um, we each have different levels of expertise in different areas. I'm not quite figured out what mine are yet, but maybe we'll figure it out tonight. So first, first question I think is a good one, you know, how accurate are PSA tests? And so as demonstrated by my talk, uh, PSA is relatively accurate. And so um, in other words, um, just some facts. Four is the cutoff is normal. Uh, it turns out that of men with PSAs less than four in a large screening test, maybe 20% of those men can have prostate cancer. So it's not a perfect test. Uh, indeed, we're looking at uh, a baseline PSA in men and seeing what it does over time uh, because the rate of rise can predict which men have prostate cancer. Also, we're using adjuncts now, as I mentioned. Percent free PSA and, and there's some new biomarkers coming, becoming available that may help us decide which men are at highest risk for prostate cancer. It's a good test. It's a perfect test. It's the best screening test we have for prostate cancer, but not, uh, but not widely used yet. <clears throat> um, this is, um, this has to do with this new genetic test called the Polaris test, and this is a test that I think now is being used in some men after uh, prostate cancer treatment to see what their risk is. Um, not enough data yet to know really how well it's going to work. Uh, is having sex good to prevent prostate cancer? So it turned <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so truth be known, uh, probably not. Uh, I will say that um, uh, it, we, we used to think that infection of the prostate didn't have any difference or didn't make any difference in who got prostate cancer, something called prostatitis. Uh, but prostatitis, in fact, which can cause um, what's called uh, chronic oxidative stress on the prostate, probably can lead to, um, uh, to prostate cancer, it turns out, this kind of genetic changes that happen to cause cancer. So in that regard, sex could go either way. For instance, men that have chronic prostatitis, we, we often think that um, sexual activity or, or frequent ejaculations may, may help clear prostatitis. Uh, having said that, um, uh, men that you know, that one way of getting prostatitis is through sexual activity. So um, it, again, pro probably not a real, real issue there. Uh, explain what a parton table is. So a parton table is similar, uh, in in many ways, to what I was describing with the Diamico risk criteria. So parton tables use PSA, 
clinical stage, meaning how the prostate feels to touch, and 1C, meaning the prostate smooth. So before, um, I'll just clarify this. Before, before guys are diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, we obviously examine the prostate. Once they're diagnosed, before they have treatment, we call that clinical stage. A little one means the prostate's smooth. The prostate has a bump on it. So on. After surgery, for instance, there are no T1s anymore. It starts at T2. So, um, for instance, if it's on, uh, and, and, and we break it down. If it's outside the prostate, we call it T3 uh, in some way. So the Parton table is similar. It just describes risk and the likelihood of there being cancer outside the prostate. Uh, how much more aggressive should you be if you have a family history? of prostate cancer. Um, how much more aggressive? So uh, an uncle or cousin, so it's, it's it, um, again, you need to be tested at about, uh, for sure, if you have a family history, father or a brother. If you have a second, de a second degree relative, but probably not at increased risk. Um, the HIFU procedure, I described it briefly, um, not available in the U.S., it, again, not ready for prime time yet, I don't think. Um, men are, be, are being flown to Europe and to Canada, to Mexico at the expense of about $25,000 to get a treatment that probably isn't as good as radiation treatments. Um, it takes a long time to do. The com it's not without complications. Um, and um, it can't treat certain areas of the prostate. Can't treat the tip of the prostate where a lot of prostate cancers e exist. Can't take can't treat the top of the prostate, just can't reach it yet. So if I, if it were my brother that just had, and I got four of them, but if any one of them had prostate cancer and they wanted to have HIFU, I would say definitely not, personally, that's just me talking, but I, I wouldn't let them have it. Fo focal therapy refers, what is focal therapy? Focal therapy re is kind of analogous to a lumpectomy. In other words, could we just remove that part of the prostate which has cancer in it? At this point, Really not. Uh, there's some places in the world that are trying to do this. Um, but this has to do with the fact that prostate cancer is most commonly uh, a disease throughout the prostate. It's not just in one area. Um, uh, I just reviewed all this information for another meeting that was in Belgium in June, but it turns out that, um, you know, I'm going to leave it at that, but at this point in time, freezing just part of the prostate or using HIFU for just part of the prostate probably isn't ready for prime time, and I, I personally am not, we're not recommending it here. It's, it is being studied. Could be that in the future with the use of MRI and that sort of thing, but currently I, I don't think it makes sense. It, it's a long-winded answer. Um, just a personal thing, we may not do that. Uh, my urologist wants to, take a bi uh, to make a biopsy, but this gentleman's on Plavix for his stent. And his question is, is so the cardiologist not, does not want to take him off Plavix, is there another way to determine if there's prostate cancer? Really not. You have to have a biopsy to know if you've got prostate cancer. Uh, other ways that determine that, you know, what the risk is of having cancer would be using some of these adjunct tests. The percent free PSA, a, P, a PCA3 test could be done, an MRI could be done, and you could put all those things together to try to figure out what the risk is. But in order to really know, you've got to have a biopsy. Almost done with the ones I have here. So, um, <laughs> uh, this is a, a one that comes up often. Have there been any studies examining the correlation between vasectomy and the occurrence of prostate cancer? There have been studies. Turns out there's not a relationship. Uh, sometimes they correlate. Long-winded answer for that one, but vasectomy does not cause prostate cancer. Um, during and after treatment, what causes incontinence and impotence? I talked about that a little bit in my slide. All these treatments can cause those things, but, but again, the good news is that most men today, with the way they're treated, with either radiation of either kind or surgery, recover essentially completely. So the treatments have to be exact and precise, and you have to have someone with experience doing it. So it makes sense. Um, you're a better, most of you are a better driver now than you were when you were 16. Surgery is a technical skill. The more the guy does of it, the better he's going to be. Same with radiation. 
and the center. There's many studies now doing that, showing that, that hospitals that do many procedures of the same kind are better at it than some hospital that just does one or two a year. Same with individuals. It just makes sense and it's, it's true. Uh, This is a, I'll, I'll answer this one, then Dr. Twardowski will. Uh, so this is kind of a, uh, uh, <clears throat> not funny, but it says, in men over the age of 70, does taking Viagra daily for a specific time help with erection function? So uh, really not. We use Viagra daily after prostatectomy, and that seems to help men recover their erections. Um, Viagra works well to help men get erections when they're st uh, stimulated sexually. It works well in all age groups of men and it works well in men that have hypertension, diabetes, and it's safe in those men. It was originally developed as a, as a heart medicine to improve blood flow to the heart, discovered by serendipity that it helps erections. Um, you can't take Viagra, Cialis, or Levitra if you take nitrates, nitroglycerin, um, Isardil, which is a pill that helps blood flow to the heart, and nitro paste. And the reason is that if you take them in conjunction, it lowers your blood pressure and you can pass out but Viagra does not cause heart attacks. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, somebody was really interested in, um, in thyroid cancer or, or thyroid issues. Can thyroid therapy increase the likelihood of contract? Thyroid uh, treatment is related to prostate cancer in any way? This one's open. Okay. Another one, also the thyroid question. <clears throat> Can any of these be used in crossover hormonal cancers such as metastatic thyroid cancer? So I assume you're referring to some of these compounds, maybe hormonal compounds. So the, the, the simple answer is, is not really. So, so all of these hormonal agents that affect the testosterone production or testosterone signal, signaling, we really think of very strictly applying to prostate cancer. However, there is a subset of cancer, of thyroid cancer, called medullary thyroid cancer that in fact is very responsive to this one drug that I mentioned called cabozantinib. That's the one that reduced all these bone metastases. And in fact, it, it, they, the company has filed for approval for a subset of, um, of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid cancer. So, so some of these agents, yes, do have overlap potentially for other tumor types, but not the, the, the main ones that I've talked about, like enzalutamide or abiraterone. Can diet improve or slow prostate cancer? Um, so that's a very tough question. I, I personally am more of a believer in cancer prevention with diet. I think once you develop real cancer with all the machinery inside the cell that's driving it forward, it's very unlikely, in my opinion, that the diet will have a key role in slowing it down. That, but it may, you know, we, we, it doesn't mean that we're not pursuing that. In fact, we, we, have, uh, we have conducted the study with, uh, with a mushroom concentrate here, where we have actually seen some effect on declines in PSA levels. Uh, there are some data with some nutritional supplements, including you know, pomegranate juice, uh, some data with uh, green tea extracts. But I would say that at this point, you know, I. I it, it may be looked at, at specific, in specific circumstances when, when the cancer burden is very low and there's no particular urgency in starting real therapy to try dietary supplementations and see if that has some effect. So I, it's not a simple answer, unfortunately. The treatment options uh, radiation question. Realistically, what regions of the body, organs, and tissues could be affected by proton or uh, X-ray beams other than the prostate. How does that influence continence or sexual function? So, so primarily what's affected uh, by radiation to the prostate are the organs that are right in the vicinity, which would be bladder and the rectum. So that's where, what kind of side effects you typically get locally from radiation therapy to prostate. You may get some frequent urination or burning on the bladder side of scattered radiation that goes to the bladder. 
and on the, on the rectal side, you may get some diarrhea. So those are the other organs that, uh, that are affected, and, and because of the radiation to the bladder, yes, there could be some effect on continency. Um, especially, I've kind of noticed in, in the setting, sometimes where we use radiation therapy after surgery when the patients uh, have a very high risk cancer and we're worried about cancer relapse and we deliver radiation therapy to that area. So some patients who have recovered continency after surgery kind of suffer a little bit of a setback and, and after radiation where the continency may, may deteriorate. Now it tends to improve again, but, um, but that could be, a, could be an effect uh, over a long period of time. The same, the sexual function. It's, it's, with radiation, it's a little bit more tricky to assess because radiation effect on sexual function is much more prolonged. It's not like with surgery where you have typically complete loss of sexual function right after surgery, and then there is recovery that's going on over months. With radiation, it's usually just declines over a period of years. And it's kind of hard to sort it out because you know, people tend to be older and age, obviously, at the same time. So it's, but it does. It does have effect, um, negative effect. You can probably address that maybe more. Uh, Oh, I guess I'm, I'm already mic. So yeah. I'll only say that um, we generally think that of men that have uh, either seed radiation or uh, female good erections before that treatment, and that aren't getting hormone therapy because hormone therapy can affect uh, sexual function as well. Um, to get either one of those two treatments, about half of those men lose, and, and they have good erections beforehand. About 50% lose the natural ability to have uh, have an erection within about a year. But of those men that lose their ability to get an erection, about half of them will respond well to drugs like Viagra. So in the end, about 75% of men are able to have natural erections, have natural sexual function at about a year, year and a half after radiation with or without drugs like Viagra. Can you explain finasteride? Uh, is that the hormone therapy? So yes, it is. Finasteride, uh, or otherwise uh, named with the trade name Proscar, it is a hormonal therapy agent, but it's really not approved or used uh, for, against prostate cancer. It's approved for benign overgrowth of the prostate, or BPH. So what that hormone does, it kind of prevents, it's an enzyme inhibitor, a certain enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, which is responsible for conversion um, of testosterone into DHT or dehydrotestosterone. It's kind of the last step of the production of testosterone byproduct, and, and it blocks it to some degree. Now, I would say that there is an interest possibly into looking more into Proscar or finasteride effect in prostate cancer and maybe combining it with other hormonal agents like Lupron and some of these newer medications because uh, when you really, look at it, I mean, on, on the surface, you would think, yes, that that compound could have some beneficial effect in certain circumstances because it uh, prevents the formation of the most potent form of testosterone called DHT. But, so it is a hormonal therapy, but currently is not approved or widely used for prostate cancer, but just for benign prostate overgrowth. Um, maybe I'll do one more and then I'll get back to you. Sure. And this is just a relatively straightforward question about the effectiveness of the Lupron Depot injection treatment. So whether that's effective, presumably as compared to more short-acting Lupron injections that uh, someone is asking about a four-month injection. And it is, yes, the answer is yes. Those, all of these formulations of these uh, injections are equally efficacious, whether you use uh, daily injection, which almost nobody uses anymore, monthly, every three months, four months, six months, they are all the same in terms of effectiveness, so, so absolutely. Okay, well, answer, just, we're, we're gonna wrap it up because of time, but um, just a couple of things here that's, uh, one is, um, do, do we remove the entire prostate? Um, question. Do they remove entire prostate after radical, after radical prostatectomy? So um, I thought it said radiation, but so after radiation, if that fails, we sometimes remove the prostate, but it's a much more complicated, um, risky surgery. Uh, the in, the, but the entire prostate is removed during prostatectomy. Thank you, Dr. Um, 
So th this also just uh, if you've had a prostatectomy, this patient really this this is a common question. It says I had my prostate removed, my PSA is slowly rising, and my urologist used the term recurrence. So when the PSA goes up after, obviously if you don't have a PSA, your P your, if, if you don't have a prostate, your PSA should be zero. If the PSA is going up after a prostatectomy, that means there are some prostate cells somewhere. And um, sometimes, and many times, that is prostate cancer recurrence. It's some cells that had skipped outside the prostate that are now growing. Sometimes those cells are in the area where the prostate was. Sometimes they're somewhere else, like in the bone or in lymph nodes. So whether we treat those uh, cancers depends on when it happens. In other words, how, how soon it is after surgery. If it's relatively soon, uh, we generally get a little bit more worried about that. But it, but it, and so we'll usually treat those men. If it's several years later, we probably will just monitor them because it probably will never affect them. What's most important, however, is the rate of rise of PSA. It's referred to as doubling time. Doubling time is beyond, is more than a year. In other words, if it takes more than a year for the PSA to double, probably that rise or re, of PSA and the recurrence of cancer would never affect those gentlemen. So they probably don't need treatment. If the rate of rise is more frequent than every six months, we would generally give radiation to those men, but, but they may need another sort of further evaluation like with a bone scan or... Um, is getting extra testosterone, if you already have low levels, a bad idea? No, it's not. So if you have uh, low, if you're um, what's called male andropause or hypogonadism, it, it can occur in up to 30% or more of men as we age. Um, sometimes referred to as male menopause. So if you have low testosterone, that can be bad for you too. So if you're, it can lead to osteoporosis, it can lead to we talked about, can le lead to decreased energy, uh, problems with sexual function, mentation. So it's okay to replace testosterone, but you should do it in a common sense way with somebody who knows what they're doing, an endocrinologist, uh, maybe your internist or family practitioner can do it, a uh, urologist can do it as long as you monitor your testosterone levels. So we don't generally think that testosterone supplementation when you need it is bad, as long as you're just getting it to a level where it's normal. Tim, I would only add to it that, you know, the, the, the one thing that you would certainly not want to do, uh, 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 scenario that you would not want to supplement testosterone if you do have prostate cancer, at, at that point it could be, could be obviously counterproductive. So it probably also is worthwhile maybe looking for it if you, if you don't, if you don't, if you've never been screened, probably that would be even more of a trigger to screen for it before actually embarking on injecting you know, extra testosterone. Because if you do harbor prostate cancer, that could stimulate it. Yeah. Although most men who have prostate cancer have normal testosterone. Right. We don't, we don't castrate That's right. or stop testosterone production in men who are newly diagnosed. We, I think we generally, but I think we're going to, see, you can see this is a little bit controversial, <laughs> which that's the nature of medicine. So I think that urologists generally believe it's okay to have a normal level testosterone. But Dr. Twardowski, I think he, we share this, we're in agreement when if some guy is newly diagnosed with prostate cancer, we don't, we would tell him to stop supplemental testosterone if he's on it. Then once he's treated, right. got his prostate out, uh, for instance, We'll, we'll, we think it's okay generally now to give testosterone back just to get you to the normal level. But you don't have to. Um, there, are some, there are some questions with personal histories here that I, we're not going to, um, I, I won't answer, only because um, it, it's difficult to, we can't give a second opinion here. Uh, you know, we really can't, it's not possible to do that because of the. Responsible in that regard. I can ask you, there's, there's a couple of really interesting questions that I don't know if I have answers for, but I think they're kind of intriguing. Somebody is asking, how does one body metabolize this PSA? Were kidneys, liver, and I don't really know. I, I think certainly not in the kidneys because PSA is a relatively large protein, so that would not be removed by the kidneys. Liver would be most likely uh, scenario or even more likely in general tissues in the circulation. It probably gets broken down. Uh, the half-life or, or, or the, the duration of PSA once it's produced in the, in the body is about three to four days. 
So it's definitely not excreted in the kidneys, but it just kind of gets broken down probably in the tissues by enzymes primarily. So just, I'll, I'll mention this one history. It's, it's reflective of what I was talking about in that this gentleman was treated two years ago. He had a PSA of 4.7. He had a Gleason score 8 in a few biopsies. And um, several biopsies were, he had a combination of uh, radiation, 25 treatments, but also got seeds. So combination and also got hormone therapy. So that would be, that would be uh, standard. In other words, if you're going to not get surgery and you're going to get radiation and be aggressive, at least in score eight, then this is a perfect example of, of what I was talking about. Right, so hormones, breakthrough therapy, and combination. It has about a probably 60% chance of curing, of curing the cancer. So um, we just have to monitor the PSA over time. He's mentioning this PSA is currently 0. Or 0, 0 0.01. That's perfect. As long as it's less than one, we're... we're yeah, so you got to wait to see what happens with the hormone therapy. Yeah. Right. So, uh, unfortunately, we, we can't tell, but we're... Just, yeah, so they're, you're in good shape. That's an important question. That are there any remedies for loss of energy due to testosterone suppressants? And you know, th th that's a very difficult problem. That there is no real magic pill for energy improvement. I, I think you suggest here in this question intermittent therapy, and in in, circumst in certain circumstances, yes, that's exactly the right strategy that can be used to give hormone therapy for a few months, then give a patient a break to recover, and but but. While you're on hormone therapy, it's very hard to find a remedy for, for energy. Uh, what's recommended paradoxically is uh, regular exercise, and that, that's really probably the only thing that actually works. I mean, there are some medications that are tried, like Ritalin, kind of stimulants medications like Provigil or Ritalin. In severe cases of fatigue, I think it can be helpful a little bit, but I've had kind of mixed results with trying those medications. But, but I would say if somebody who is extremely affected by it, we could, you could try one of those stimulatory medications like Ritalin or Provigil. All right. Thanks so, thanks so much. We need to wrap up right now. We need to wrap up. Maybe you can address that afterwards. Right, I will. Um, we do need to wrap up, and let's give our doctors a big hand, okay? Thank you. They are wonderful, and we so appreciate them staying late tonight to give this presentation to the community. We really do. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, Thank Dr. Kordeski.